Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In 1860, the Clotilda was the last ship to have brought enslaved Africans to American shores, 50 years after such trade had been outlawed. To hide their crime, its owners ordered the ship burned once it reached Alabama waterways. In this episode, you'll meet Ben Raines, the Alabama journalist who finally discovered the long-lost shipwreck, detailed its terrible history, and writes of the impact the Clotilda's voyage had on generations of people in both Africa and Alabama in his new book, The Last Slave Ship, the true story of how Clotilda was found, her descendants, and an extraordinary reckoning. First on five tonight, we have breaking news. The Clotilda has been discovered. The Alabama Historical Commission and the National Geographic Society confirming the find this afternoon. The ship was destroyed in the Delta shortly after it arrived. It hasn't been seen since, but now crews have discovered it. The remains of the ship reportedly located near 12 Mile Island in the Mobile River Delta. The State Historical Commission will hold a press conference to announce all of the details of the find, and that press conference will be held in Africa Town, the Mobile community that was founded by the slaves who were brought here on the Clotilda. Ben Raines, you tell the story of the Clotilla discovery in your new book called The Last Slave Ship. And in fact, you were instrumental in the ship's discovery. Uh, tell me about this project and how you got involved. Uh, well, it, it all started with a phone call from a friend. Um, I had been, in, been an investigative reporter here in Mobile for almost 20 years, but I'd never thought of looking for the Clotilda. It was just something you heard about as part of you know local legend, and uh, it was talked about in the community. So a friend of mine heard a historian on the radio here in Mobile saying if we could ever find the Clotilda, that would solve one of America's greatest maritime mysteries. And he called me up and said, listen, you should look for the Clotilda. And I just told him it sounded like looking for pirate treasure and was ridiculous. (laughs) But he started selling me on the story on the phone. We hung up. I typed Google or I typed Clotilda into Google and uh, I was immediately hooked. Um, I'd ordered all the books and I started digging into the actual historical documents, the primary stuff, uh, almost immediately. And that, that was in August of 2017. Um, and I actually held up the first piece of the ship to see the light of day in 160 years, eight months later in April of 2018. Why were you successful? People have been searching for the Clotilda for a very long time. Why were you successful when others had not been? Well, you know, the big the big thing was everybody was listening to the, the man who perpetrated the crime, Timothy Mayer, who was an Alabama steamboat captain uh, and one of the wealthiest people in Alabama in the 1800s. So he, um, he made a bet on the deck of his steamboat when a bunch of wealthy passengers were out drinking whiskey and smoking cigars one night in 1859, and he bet these Yankees that he could go to Africa and and capture, you know, bring back uh, some enslaved people. So um, he did and was successful, but he had been bragging about the trip the whole time the ship he hired was sailing to Africa. You know, you've got to remember this was illegal in 1860. It had been illegal to import people from other countries as to enslave them since 1808. So this was a capital crime and he could have been hung for it. So he bragged about it so much that the federal government, federal agents were watching him and his house by the time the ship came back three months later. So they knew that they had to uh, they had to go out and, and hide the ship when it came back and they decided to burn it. So he spent the next 30 years of his life after having gotten away with this. They burned the ship to hide the crime and, you know, it sank below the water. So he lied about where the ship was for the next 30 years. He gave the series of interviews over and over and over. Uh, and every time he said a different location, you know, Bayou Cannot, Bayou Corn, all these different bayous in this gigantic swamp that sits above Mobile. And I say gigantic, it's about 250,000 acres. Imagine a swamp that's 15 miles wide and 60 miles long. <laughs> and so he'd been lying about where the ship was in all these places. And everyone who had searched for it had listened to him in his interviews and gone and looked in the places he suggested, all of which were just to throw you off the trail. Um, and so I, I went and looked at the historical documents and found some other references where people who were there that night gave a different location. And they all gave the same location, 12 Mile Island. And that's ultimately where I found the ship. So what ultimately is the significance in finding the Clotilta and, and understanding her place in history? 
Well, the Clotilda is incredibly unique. It's actually um, unlike any other, uh, the, the people who arrived on it. This is a window into the past that we've never had before. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it was illegal since 1808 to bring people in to the country. So all the, all the enslaved people that were here by the time of the Civil War, almost every one of them had been born here. So we didn't have people who had been through the Middle Passage any longer and things like that. And we had really scattered recollections of those things. But with the Clotilda story, because it happened so late and because it was exceptionally well documented, we know everything about the voyage and the people who came on the ship. These people were captured in 1860 when they were between 15 and about 30. So many of them lived up into the 1910s, 20s. One, Cujo Lewis, the most famous of the passengers, lived to 1935. And these people were interviewed dozens of times. So starting with the voyage itself, um, we have the captain's journal from when he sailed from Mobile, Alabama to the port of Ouida in the kingdom of Dahomey, which is modern day Benin. We know all the provisions he took that he thought he would need to carry home more than 100 people in terms of water, casks of meat, rice, food, rum, all those things. We know what happened when he got to, to Dahomey. He met with uh, the, the palace and he bartered for these people. We know he paid 27 pounds of gold for them. Um, so then we, we also have um, the, the perspective of the Africans because they were interviewed first in 1909 by a Mobile woman named Emma Roche who there were still nine of the, the Clotilda passengers alive. And so she interviewed them then, which then inspired Zora Neale Hurston to come back and interview Cujo in 1928, when he was the last still alive of the original settlers of Africatown. So from th those two interviews, we have um, the horrors of an African slaving raid as experienced by its victims. We have what life was like in a barracoon, a slave prison. Uh, we know uh, when these people were captured. We, we know uh, where they were captured. We know who sold them. We know how much. We know the ship they came back to America on. And then because they were interviewed, we know what happened to them while they were enslaved. And we know what happened when they were freed. Um, and then they settled this town here on the edge of Mobile called Africa Town, which was they built a village based on the, the African villages they had grown up with. That village is still there with the descendants of these people that were brought over on the Clotilda. So with the Clotilda, we have the whole story and it serves as sort of a proxy for everyone in the United States and really in the world whose families arrived in whatever country they're in, in the hold of a ship. Um, most of those people, millions upon millions, we know nothing about because their stories weren't recorded. So the Clotilda is a proxy for this lost history for these millions of people who were stolen from Africa and spread all over the world. And that's really what is so unique about it. Um, it is the whole story of, of slavery all encapsulated in one in one piece. And we know everything about these people and what happened to them in their lives. Well, let's go back to this Timothy Mayer, who was the instigator of this. This was a federal crime. Uh, why was he willing to take this kind of risk? Well, Timothy Mayer was trying to thumb his nose at the federal government. So he was he was actually from Maine. Um, he, you know, he grew up in a state where there were fewer than, than a thousand African-Americans when he lived there. And he came to Alabama, where more than half the population was African-American, mostly enslaved. But he was in this new world. He became a fully vested southern plantation owner by the time of the Clotilda story. He started out as a deckhand and he ended up with nine steamboats moving all this stuff. Um, you know, cotton is what he was moving down the river. Um, so, you know, with Timothy Mayer, he uh, is, is heavily invested in the Civil War, which was about to start. So there was a case going on in court regarding a ship called the Wanderer. The Wanderer came in in Georgia with 378 people on it, I believe, who were stolen from Africa. They were being illegally imported. The guy who brought them in uh, a wealthy Georgian, a no good playboy, really, um, who shot his own uncle's eye out trying to, in, in, a, in a duel with someone, a <laughs> uh, really crazy guy. He brought these people in and got arrested. So there was a court case going on, and it was being covered all over the country. The New York Times was covering it, the New York Tribune, all the way down in Georgia. And so this was what they were discussing on the deck of the steamboat the night Mayor made his bet. They were talking about this case, and there were some Yankee passengers, one from New York, one from uh, Virginia, and they were talking with Mayor about it with another group, a group of men. One of them said, well, I think they should hang the lot of them, talking about the people in Georgia who had been caught. 
He said, we'll hang them all. That'll scare the rest off from ever doing something like this. And Mayer said, nonsense. They're not going to hang anybody. I could go do it myself. Within two years, I could bring in a load of, of slaves from Africa. They bet $1,000, which is equivalent to about $30,000 today. And then Mayer set about doing it. And within six or eight months, he had actually succeeded and brought in a load of, of enslaved people. Um, so he was doing it specifically to thumb his nose at the government. And it, it, it worked. Um, it was written about all over the country. In fact, after the Clotilda left Mobile, it was written about in papers all over the country. The Clotilda has gone to Africa for a load of slaves. Um, so that's why the government was looking for him, as I had mentioned. He had bragged so much. You also described the economics of cotton and the prices that, that enslaved people commanded in the, in the late 1850s. Would you explain how, how cotton had expanded so much that the, the free labor was really in demand in ways that there weren't even enough to fulfill it? Yeah, well, so if you step back a little bit to 1813 or so, that's when Andrew Jackson made his name running Native Americans out of Alabama, the Trail of Tears and all the people that ended up in Oklahoma. Maybe that was 1820. Anyway, that opened Alabama up for settlement. And as Alabama opened up, it, cotton is what they started growing. And production in Alabama grew exponentially year over year, which meant they needed more and more labor. So because of the... the um, because you were no longer allowed to bring new slaves in after 1808, you could only use people who were already in the country. And they were running out. They, um, they, they just didn't have enough in the South as the crop burgeoned and, and you know, became bigger and bigger, more and more square miles. So they were buying people from the northern slave states, Maryland and Virginia, which didn't have the same kind of um, the farming going on and didn't need as much you know, human power. So a, a, an enslaved person in Maryland back then, in, the, in this time frame we're talking about, 18, late 1850s to 1860, was about $500. And in Mobile, they were close to $2,000. And so Southerners were looking on this as almost a tariff forced on them by the North because they wouldn't let them bring enslaved people in. And so that was what set up this. The, the South, one of the goals of the Civil War was to reopen the international slave trade. That's the reason that the Alamo happened in Texas. They were trying to turn Texas into a new slave state so there would be more places you could bring people in. And we see this again and again. So really, it was all about the economy of the South collapsing. And Mayer knew better than most because in addition to being this plantation, I mean, the steamboat captain, he was a plantation owner. He and his three brothers together owned more than 50 people who worked their three plantations. So he was fully vested in this. He saw that all their profits were disappearing into manpower. Um, you know, a, a, an enslaved person in Mobile at that time was the equivalent of about $55,000 in today's money. So you can imagine this was a, a lot of money, and the price was a quarter of that in those northern slave states. So that's where the South's economy was, was falling apart. Um, the free labor was no longer free. In fact, it was very expensive. How, how much capital did Mayer invest in uh, find, finding the ship, the Clotilda, outfitting it with crew and setting off? So uh, quite a lot. The Clotilda was built by a man named William Foster, who lived um, in a rooming house very near uh, Mayer's plantation. So Mayer and his brothers had a, a sawmill where they cut wood and a shipyard where they built ships. So Foster built the Clotilda in Mayer's shipyard, but only as a, as a cargo ship. So its first five years, it's traveling around the south, picking up uh, around the, the, the Gulf Coast, really, all the way to Mexico and, and the Caribbean moving things like wood from Alabama, you know, pine lumber to Cuba and coming back with loads of rum and things like that. So it was known to be one of the fastest ships around because uh, William Foster was an excellent shipbuilder and he designed this ship for speed, which is what Mayer wanted to do a quick, discreet mission to Africa. So he told William Foster he would buy the Clotilda from him for $35,000 if Foster would captain it to Africa to make this run for for slaves. Uh, now, $35,000 back then is more than a million dollars. He also told Foster he would pay him with 10 of the captives, which is, we're looking at more than a half million dollars. So right there, Mayer has spent over one and a half million dollars in today's currency. And then he gave Foster 27 pounds of gold to buy the people with, which back then was worth another, you know, several hundred thousand dollars more. So um, right here, you've got William or Timothy Mayer spending close to $2 million on this caper to win a $1,000 bet. 
is pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on a whim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. If there was a risk of prison or even the death sentence for being involved in a venture like this, how was Captain Foster able to find a crew? Well, he didn't tell them what they were doing. <laughs> Foster went around to find what he called men of the mast, uh, who were just itinerant sailors. Mobile at the time, thanks to cotton, was the second biggest port on the Gulf Coast and the third biggest port in the country. You know, the port rankings were New York, New Orleans, and Mobile. So it was a cosmopolitan port with sailors from all over the world. Um, you would walk through downtown Mobile and hear languages coming at you from every direction, from, from various far-flung places. So Foster went and specifically found basically a bunch of ragtag drunks who didn't have family and had no local connections. And he brought them on the boat and didn't tell them what they were doing. Um, they actually set sail. And after they passed Cuba, they hit a hurricane and suffered terrible damage to the ship. Uh, in fact, the rudder was almost torn off. So the ship was badly crippled. Um, crippled like it was, one of the anti-slaving squadron ships came up behind it and gave chase. And so uh, Foster ran rather than surrender and let them look. That was the crew's first tip-off, that they were not just hauling a load of lumber. The reason they thought they were hauling lumber is because Foster and Mayer, before the ship left the port, had hidden all the supplies you would need to, to bring 110 people back, all that extra water and food and all that, under stacks of lumber, making it look like the hold of the ship was full of lumber, not full of supplies for bringing people. So when this, they had to stop for repairs in Porta Playa, and while they were there, the crew figured out, we're on a slaving ship. You're turning us into pirates and putting at us risk for the death penalty. So Foster offered to double their wages. This was the, f the first of four mutinies the crew threw during this trip <laughs> because they were not excited to be put up for a capital crime. Um, you know, it was punishable by death at the time. So basically, he tricked these guys into doing this. Their destination, as you said, was the modern-day state of Benin. Uh, you, your, your readers will get a, a really uh, distressing look at uh, its role in the international slave trade. Tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, so uh, the port of Ouida, which was Benin's slave port, um, was responsible for deporting close to a third of all the people who were ever sold into slavery, uh, millions of people. Not all that many people from Benin ended up in America, but the people on the, on the Clotilda certainly did. So starting in the late 1500s, early 1600s, the kingdom of Dahomey emerged as um, this slave place where you could go, you know, a Dutch slave trader in the 1600s wrote, you could go to these other ports and might get three or four people in a week. You could go to Ouida and have several thousand people in a matter of hours because Dahomey had turned it into an industrial, uh, industrial effort. The entire economy of the kingdom of Dahomey was built around hunting people. And so they would go out, you have to imagine Dahomey, the kingdom, or Benin rather, modern day Benin is about the size of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the kingdom of Dahomey was about the size of, say, uh, Philadelphia. And so imagine Philadelphia going out and stealing millions of people over the course of 300 years from the rest of Pennsylvania. And that's what happened there in Africa. Um, and when the Dahomeans attacked these places, they destroyed them. They killed everybody in a village who wasn't of the age to become a slave. If you were young, a child, they killed you. If you were an older person, they killed you because they didn't want to leave anybody behind who might seek revenge against Dahomey for stealing everyone. So as they expanded around their original kingdom, they had this sort of ghost town of all these abandoned villages. You know, and we'll never know what cultures were lost because many times these villages, and Cujo's village was this way, were wiped off the map. You know, everyone was dead after, after a raid. So um, basically what the Dahomans did was um, turn slavery into a massive economy. They captured tens of thousands of people a year. The English, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, they all built prisons in Ouida. They built them themselves to house slaves destined for their colonies. Um, so it was really fully industrialized business that they 
you know, and, and Dahomey was considered the greatest military power in West Africa. And it was all because they had so much money to buy guns and, and other weaponry, thanks to selling so many people. Yeah, one of your statistics is that they had a 50,000 person army and uh, supplied by Western guns and lots of gold. Were the payments always in gold? Um, everyone I've encountered, but there was often there were sweeteners in the deal. Um, rum was particularly uh, prominent in those things, and other alcohol. Um, I think a lot of times the Dahomeans were paid in in fine fabrics, silks, and things. If you look at some of the lithographs made by um, English naval officers who visited Dahomey in the 1850s, these these the, the king is wearing these beautiful silk uh, robes and things that look like they came right out of Paris. Um, you know, he's wearing this huge hat with tassels all the way around, um, you know, really elaborate clothing. And, and that was kind of the story for the whole country. Um, there was a very prosperous upper uh, level. And this, you know, it was this tribe, the Fon, that is still the main dominant tribe in Benin today. Um, and so they were paid in, in mostly gold, but I think they got a lot of other luxury items as well that, you know, you couldn't get any other way except having them arrive on a ship. How long was the Clotilda in port and how many people did the Dahomeans sell to them? So uh, the, the Clotilda was actually in Ouida, anchored off of Ouida for about eight days. And Foster, uh, correctly it turns out, thought that the Dahomeans were trying to engineer a double cross <laughs> where they would sell him people, take his money, and then call the British anti-slaving squadron and say, hey, there's a guy with a bunch of illegal slaves off the coast. You should come get him. Um, and, and so that actually happened. And Foster wrote in his journal that he was worried that they were going to do this because it had been so long. He wanted to show up, give them the money, and leave the same day. And instead, they, they brought him ashore, put him up in very nice accommodations, and he was left to wander around the villages for, for a full week. Um, and then when they got all of the captives, 110 people that he was able, he bought 125 people for the 27 pounds of gold. Um, but as they were loading them, they had 110 on board and there came the British slaving squadron over the horizon. Um, they saw uh, the, the steam, you know, the steamer um, exhaust stacks on two warships headed for them, steam powered ships. So they cut the anchor rope, uh, the Clotilda did, and left without their last load of people that was headed toward the ship in a giant, in a giant boat. The only reason that the, the um, Clotilda was able to outrun them was because it was such a, you know, an especially fast ship. And they had actually put extensions on the mast so that they could fly bigger sails and, and go even faster than normal. Uh, as you told us earlier, one of those passengers' uh, captives was... Uh, a, a person whose life was was captured by Zora Neale Hurston, the writer named Kujo Lewis. Uh, I have a clip because Zora Neale Hurston's book was published for the first time just recently. And the editor of that book, whose name is Deborah Plant, reads a passage from Kujo Lewis talking about his capture. Let's listen. When I think about those times, I try not to cry no more. My eyes... They don't stop crying, but the tears run down inside of me all the time. When the men pull me with them, I call my mama name. I don't know where she is. I don't see none of my family. I don't know where they is. I beg the men to let me go and find my folks. The soldiers say they got no ears for crying. The king of Dalmay come to hunt slaves to sell. So they tie me in the line with the rest. That is Kujo Lewis's description of what it was like to be captured uh, by fellow Africans and sold into slavery. Uh, the title of Zora Neale Hurston's book was Barracoon. What does that word mean? That's the word for a prison, a slave prison. It was called a barracoon. Um, and so that's she, she's, you know, she's writing about what happened to Cujo. And an interesting little wrinkle in this story is that Cujo's grandfather had Africans enslaved for his personal use. He had slaves. Cujo grew up knowing his grandfather's slaves and knowing they had been sold through Ouida. So when he was captured, he knew what was in store for him. What did we learn uh, through his story and others about the time on the ship, the Middle Passage? What was life like aboard the Clotilda? Well, um, in some measure, the Clotilda might have been a slightly more comfortable trip across than, you know, some of the, the um, some of the slave ships of the era were carrying more than a thousand people at a time. 
and um, they, it was just a, a basically a, a, an attrition sort of thing. They barely fed them. They kept them chained and lying down, um, and many, many people would die on the crossing, but it was just a cost of doing business. With the Clotilda, partly because Foster, I think, was invested in, he was getting 10 of these people, um, but also because they had, they had planned to get as many as 175 people. Um, so they had a lot of food. They had extra food and they had a little more room in the hold, but these people were chained around the neck. They were naked. The neck chains were run through to the floor and they were chained to the floor to pegs in the floor in groups of eight. Uh, it was, I think, um, 13 days before they were brought up from the hold and allowed to walk around on the deck. They were unable to walk, uh, when they first got up there. Um, in the hold, uh, they, you know, just had to go to the bathroom wherever their peg was. And so when a group got brought up on deck, it would be allowed or forced to scrub its little area during the crossing. Um, and then another group would be brought up. And, um, so this went on, you know, for the whole trip at one point, Cujo talks about something that's very chilling, um, that I've only seen one mention of in all of the literature, literature associated with, with everything aboard the Clotilda. Um, and he says that they were all brought up on deck, all the groups, and they were all chained to the anchor chain um, by their neck chains were hooked to the anchor chain because the, the Clotilda was being chased by another anti-slaving squadron ship. And so um, it's very notorious. And a lot of times uh, in the historical record, in fact, the, the movie uh, Amistad begins with a scene like this. Um, the slavers would have the slave chained to the anchor chains so that if they got caught, they'd cut the anchor loose and it would drag all the people evidence overboard. And so at one point in this journey, Clotilda, the Clotilda journey, Cujo actually describes being chained to the anchor chain with everyone else. And, and you know, I'm sure they didn't know that they were about to be cast overboard, but um, that's the kind of conditions they were in. Just horrific uh, at the edge of death every minute. Um, hard to imagine. And, you know, this was by the time they were on the ship, it had been about a month since they were captured. Um, when you read the book, you'll read these incredible, these brutal descriptions of what happened to them. Um, you know, in one poignant scene, Cujo describes uh, the Dahomans took the heads of everyone they killed as, as war tri you know, trophies. And he describes seeing people he knew, their heads being smoked over a fire. Um, so that's what's in his mind during this time he's chained to the deck of this ship. Um, it's, it's almost unbearable to even think about, you know, the life of horrors that would leave you with. From a legal standpoint, the most perilous part of the journey for Foster and Mayer would have been the arrival on the southern shores of the United States. How did they evade detection? Well, so there's a, um, when you're on the water, you can only see about 15 miles across open water because of the curvature of the earth. So Foster and, and Mayer knew this, and they knew that if they kept 20, 25 miles off the coast of Alabama, the two forts at the mouth of Mobile Bay, which were federal forts, would never see the ship. So they stayed well offshore instead of coming right up the bay. And they sailed to Mississippi. Um, there's a series of barrier islands in front of Alabama and Mississippi. They sailed all the way to Mississippi and hooked around one of the Mississippi barrier islands and headed back into Alabama and hid at a secret location on the coast uh, well away from civilization that Mayer and Foster had selected before the journey. So um, they get there and they ended up waiting there a couple of days um, because it took that long for Mayer to get organized enough to bring a steamboat down. So the plan was then, um, the original plan was they were going to unload the Clotilda passengers there and take them into the back to the plantations aboard steamboats. But because Mayer had done so much bragging and the heat was on in town, they said, okay, we got to destroy the Clotilda. So they brought uh, a steamboat down to, you know, they sailed from Mobile uh, to, the, to where the ship was hidden. They took the mass off the ship to make it look more like a barge. And then at night, they towed the ship up the bay, hoping it would look just like a steamboat towing a cargo barge. And then when they got up to the top of the bay, on, on the west side of the bay is the Port of Mobile. But there's a big island across from the Port of Mobile. And so they went around that island and into this giant swamp network I mentioned, the Mobile Tensaw Delta. And they sailed up the rivers there and, and escaped view from the port. Um, and so that was, that was the big trick. They made it into this giant swamp and went about 
eight or nine miles inland into the swamp before they burned the ship and hid it and everything. And really, if you're going to hide something as big as an ocean-going ship, what better place to do it than a giant, desolate, alligator-infested swamp? So did Mayer and Foster ever face legal consequences? Well, yes. Um, they were all arrested within a week of the voyage. Um, Mayer was arrested first, in fact, and accused of this caper. Um, I say caper, this crime. Um, he was able to uh, evade justice entirely. You know, the, a lot of the history tells you that he did this. He was clever and he had his alibi of being on the deck on his, his other steamboat on its regular run because he wasn't at the Clotilda site the whole time. And he had, you know, met up with this steamboat and ate dinner with the passengers. And so that was his alibi. That's part of it. The real story, I think, why Mayor got away with it and everyone else did, is the federal judge in Mobile, Judge Johnson, was one of Mayor's best friends. Mayor named the first steamboat he built after the judge. And so here we are 10, 15 years later, and this judge who has a steamboat named after him is is the one in charge of Mayor's case. And he threw it out and let Mayor off the hook right then, first, immediately. Uh, as soon as the, the ship happened, Foster was the only one who still faced legal jeopardy because he had brought the Clotilda back and not checked in at the port. The reason you're supposed to check in at the port is because that's how the government would charge taxes and, and um, you know, any duties you had to pay for whatever you were bringing in. And so he had evaded that. So he was facing a thousand dollar fine. He kept Judge Johnson kept delaying Foster's trial um, for more than a year until the Civil War started. And then the case disappeared because Judge Johnson became one of the first district court judges for the Confederacy. He, he abandoned the federal court system and switched over to the Confederate side. And so that was the end of anybody being prosecuted for uh, the Clotilda crime. So he won his bet. He won his bet. You're right. He did. No one was hung for it. In fact, the only person ever hung in the U.S. for slaving was hung about um, – he, he was captured – within a week or two of when the Clotilda returned to America. This man was captured with his ship down around the Keys. Every president from Thomas Jefferson, including Thomas Jefferson, forward, many of our founding fathers, Adams, um, all pardoned convicted slavers. Abraham Lincoln became the first president to refuse to pardon a convicted slaver, and he let this man that was captured right around the time of the Clotilda's trip be hung. Um, and that was that's the only person ever hung for illegal slaving in American history. The Clotilda captives arrived in 1860. They had five years of enslavement before the end of the Civil War. Was there anything the, uh, that marked their experience enslaved in Alabama that's different from the majority of enslaved people who had been born in the United States? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's 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 really critical. Um, the first thing was that many of the people on board the Clotilda all came from the same village, which was Bonte, where Cujo was from. Um, and so they already had lifelong bonds. You know, he talks about one of his close friends being among the captured people. So they were already bonded like that. And then they spent the time in the Barracoon with these other people and got to know them for a month. And then they spent, you know, the, the month and a half uh, on the ship. So by the time they all got to America, these 110 people were very close. They knew each other well. They'd suffered through this horrible hardship. Um, and, and that alone was, you know, a powerful thing. And then they didn't get split up. They were not sold for the most part. 30 of them were sold to a slave dealer and ended up somewhere else. The other 80, though, were split among three brothers and one or two neighbors. And they were all on plantations that were very close together, but also connected by the steamboats. So Timothy Mayer and his brothers had this fleet of steamboats. Cujo and some of the others ended up working as deckhands on the steamboats, which was a brutal occupation during during um, the slavery era. But every week they would run up the river and stop at the other plantations where all their friends were. And so they all kept in touch throughout the Civil War. They all knew where they were. So when the war ended, they all came back together. They banded together back in this group. And um, that was a critical thing. But during the, the time they were enslaved, because they were from the same village, you know, Cujo had been trained as a warrior for five years by the time he was captured. He was 19 years old. Um, so they get captured and they fight back during enslavement. One of the first and most uh, powerful stories, uh, an overseer on one of the mayor plantations started whipping a woman, one of the Africans. All the Africans charged him took the whip and they whipped the overseer in the field until other 
um, mayor employees could come and get them off of him. And as Cujo says, nobody whipped an African anymore after that. A woman. The men got whipped a lot more after that. It's clear from Cujo's stories. And then there was another story where um, one of the women from Africa, who was quite young, some of them were as young as 12. So one of the young ones, uh, who was apparently very pretty, mayor's wife took a shine to her and wanted her to be a, a house servant. And so he, she had her, she had a hired cook in her house, uh, Aunt Polly, and she told Aunt Polly to train this girl how to clean house and do things like that. Aunt Polly was having a hard time teaching her how to sweep and knocked her in the head, you know, hit her in the head and yelled at her or whatever. And uh, the story we have, the girl screams, this blood curdling scream, and the Africans come running from the fields and they're carrying whatever implements they were using. If they had knives for cutting you know, stalks down or shovels or whatever. Suddenly there are 30 Africans and they charge into the house and get the girl. And then they chase Timothy Mayer's wife and Aunt Polly upstairs where they lock themselves in a bedroom. So right there, you know, you see what the, the, the metal of the Africans, they fought back. Um, they banded together, they stayed together. And that's how they were able to survive enslavement. And then afterward build this town. Uh, because their community, their you know their their togetherness hadn't been destroyed the way it had for most enslaved people. Um, this group managed to stay together, and that proved to be all the difference in the world. But an irony that you write about is that they were discriminated against not just by white Alabamians, but by other black people who had been even those who had been enslaved. Why was that? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, um, first they couldn't speak English, and as they learned it, uh, their pronunciation was never very good. When you read Barracoon, Zora Neale Hurston's book, you see the dialect she ascribes to Cujo. Um, you can tell he had a heavy accent even after he'd been in the country for first 80 years. Um, so they were mocked by the Africans. They also had uh, tattoos. Most all of them had facial scarifications, which are very common even today in, in Benin, that identify your tribe. Um, Cujo's teeth were chiseled to make holes. So when he smiled, he had an oval on each side of his mouth, you know, where you could see air through. And, and the other, um, other Africans had, had similar things. Um, so they stood apart for that reason. But when they got here, they acted very African. Um, on Sundays, they didn't have to work. And so they would dance all day. Um, they would sing, doing African dances and things. Um, when one of their number died, they would hold an African funeral where they would, you know, bury the person standing up, and then they would all join hands and sway and sing these songs in their native languages. So they were very outside the uh, black-born American slaves' world, and and perhaps those people felt threatened, the American-born slaves. But whatever, they ostracized the Africans. Uh, and this continued. This continued with the next generation. When the Africans were freed and had children, the American-born slaves mocked the Africans' children for having these savage African parents. And Cujo talks about American-born blacks calling him and his children savages and all the, all the same uh, insults that, that we've heard applied to, to African Americans still to this day. The, the black Americans were saying that to the, the African-born um, Clotilda captives, uh, which, which, you know, is sad, but not all of them were. Cujo talks about um, this incredibly important influence on them, a man named Free George, who had been a slave, but his girlfriend, who was a cook for a wealthy family and was free, bought his freedom. So Free George came to see the Africans all the time, encouraged them to vote after they were freed, uh, introduced them to Christianity. Cujo talks about Free George was the best friend the Africans ever had. I mean, he says that. So uh, the Africatown community that they created, you also talk about its trajectory from a bustling community of up to 12,000 to the 1990s when it was a, a site of, of neglect and disrepair. What were the causes of its downslide? Um, they were entirely uh, forced on the community by the city and state government in Alabama. Um, the um, Africatown prospered in the from, from the 1900s forward, um, partly because it was a place apart from white mobile. Um, and so all these businesses built up. And then there were a couple of big factories that came to town. And those provided jobs and things. Um, and so that Africatown grew and grew. By 1912, it was the fourth biggest community in America governed by African Americans. Um, and by the 50s and 60s, as you say, you know, there are more than 10,000 people there working these jobs. They're building nice brick homes. Everybody's driving new cars. Um, 
two things happened in the 90s that destroyed Africatown completely. Um, the first one was uh, they built a bridge. There was a little two-lane drawbridge that led into Africatown and a two-lane road. And they, the, that's the road, when they built that road, they actually took land from Cujo and the settlers, and they ran the road right through their properties. But it was only a two-lane road. And so a business district sprang up around that road over the next 80 years. Um, and there were, you know, barber shops and grocery stores and movie theaters and restaurants. It was a thriving business district. 1992, the city of Mobile and the state of Alabama announced they're going to expand that road. They're going to make, instead of a two-lane drawbridge, they're going to have a six-lane interstate bridge and an interstate right through that same corridor, the heart of Africa Town. They destroyed all the rest of the buildings that the original founders built. You know, when the Africans were freed, they bought lands from their enslavers, from Timothy Bear and some of the other plantation owners. Uh, and then they pulled together and built each other's houses and built a church and a school, all these things. The highway department decided to run this new interstate right through the heart of where all the original settle settlers lived. They destroyed Cujo's house in 1992 to build this road, along with every other structure the Africans had built in the 1870s. So that was a major blow. And when they did that and built the road, they also destroyed the entire commercial district. Instead of a community of four neighborhoods where you could walk from one to another and all, all of a sudden two of the neighborhoods were cut off from the other two by this giant highway. Kids could no longer get to school. Families couldn't walk across the street to see their grandmother. Uh, when they had a funeral at the church, they could no longer get to the cemetery. They, they, they didn't even put a light in the highway department. Uh, and then in 2000, um, the paper mills closed. And the international paper paper mill that was on the edge of Africa town was the largest paper mill in the world. So in a heartbeat, thousands of jobs were taken from the community as well because many people in Africa town worked there. Couple that with the crack epidemic, and Africa town was just left in shambles by the end of the 90s. And there are fewer than 2,000 people there today and no businesses. Um, the entire business district is gone. So let's move to the third part of the, of the story you tell, because your subtitle refers to an extraordinary reckoning and what the finding of the Clotilda might mean for the several groups involved in this story. Let me start with Benin, of all, of all places. You traveled to Benin in, in uh, your pursuit of understanding the story. What did you find about the modern-day government's uh, understanding of its role and how it has come to terms with it? Well, so Benin... Um as I mentioned, it's about the size of Pennsylvania. And the dominant tribe back in the slavery era was the Fon tribe. And they're still the dominant tribe in Benin today. Um, and then all the other tribes were the tribes that the Fon were capturing. So, you know, within Benin today, you have the tribes that captured everybody on board the Clotilda, and you have the handful of tribes that were all represented on the Clotilda. So, Everyone in Benin today is a descendant of either the people who are capturing people or the people who are being captured. And that has led to this simmering um, tension between these tribes, where their villages, uh, where tribes that were captured, say the Yoruba, Yoruban tribe, they would say, don't speak to the Fon, don't go to their stores, we won't send our kids to school with them. So the government has been worried about a sort of Rwandan style genocide, because, you know, the Rwanda genocide was a tribal disagreement that got out of control. And here you've got a bunch of tribes that are angry at the Fon, and they've carried that forward. Ancestor worship is a big deal in Benin. Um, Benin is home of voodoo, the native the Vodun religion, Vodun, they say. Um, that's how voodoo got to South America, how it got to the Caribbean, how it got to America, to Louisiana. All that came out of Benin. And so um, these tribal resentments there are, are still bubbling under the surface. And so Benin has taken a, a really amazing and active role in uh, trying to come to terms with its past. They're trying to have a, a national reconciliation. When you ride around Benin, there are monuments to the people who were lost to slavery all over, and they are brutal. Um, there'll be a, a you'll see a, a life-size person on a pedestal as you're driving down the road, and that person is gagged and handcuffed and chained down on their knees, and it's just this lifelike statue right there in the heart of town. Um, you'll see walls where there are severed limbs all over them, representing people lost to slavery. Um, you'll be walking around, and you'll see these little statues with heads cast down and the eyes looking away like that, with no face, and that's meant to shame the living for for their role in slavery. So. Um, <clears throat> 
I was stunned to find they're having a moment. We, here in America, we're talking about reparations these days and whether people who are descendants of enslaved people should be given something for you know the lives that were stolen from their ancestors. They're having that kind of conversation in Benin, too. Um, and it's, it's exactly the same issue, slavery. The president of Benin right now, uh, this man Patrice Talon, was attacked in the last election because he has slave dealers in his family tree. So you can see that wound is still present there in a way I had never understood or, or um, anticipated when I got there. It was quite remarkable. Um, we, and it was amazing to see them wrestling with it. We have about 10, 12 minutes left. Uh, let me turn to the descendants of the Clotilda, the Mayer family and the Foster family. Uh, you contacted both of them. And what did you find about their reactions to the discovery of the Clotilda? Well, the Mayer family has refused to ever speak um, about uh, their role in the saga. Um, they claim that they got death threats after the movie Amistad came out in 2005, which was, of course, about a group of enslaved people taking over a ship. Um, and so they have yet to ever speak publicly at all um, and say they won't. I've spoken to some of the mayors, and they just say, no, I'm not doing that. Um, whereas this descendant of Captain Foster, I, when I wrote my first story about having found the ship, um, he, he uh, reached out to me and said, I had no idea. I'm related to this man. I, I had no idea my family was involved in something like this. I'm so sorry. I wish I could apologize. Well, it just so happens that the descendants of the Clotilda passengers, the captives, have been dying to have exactly that kind of meeting, a reconciliation with someone who participated in, in the Clotilda in capturing their, their uh, and selling their relatives. And I so I asked Mike, I said, will you come here and meet with the descendants? And he was terrified, uh, but he did come. You know, when he got here, he told me he'd taken his wedding ring off and wasn't gonna mention his family in case somebody wanted to somehow punish him for what his ancestors had done. And we walked into the room with a handful of descendants, the first ones he was to meet. And he said, I'm Mike Foster, and I'm here because, you know, it was a terrible thing that was done to your ancestors, and it was my ancestor that did it, and I just want to apologize. And he was just enveloped in hugs. You know, everybody's crying, uh, and then everybody's laughing and joking. Um, and then Mike went to a big community celebration the next day and just walked around meeting everybody, and everybody's hugging him. Everybody was crying. It was a really powerful moment, and it was the first chance that the community um, – you know, Africa town, the descendants of the Clotilda had for that kind of reconciliation. And, you know, someone said to me in the book, uh, reparations are nothing. Reconciliation, that's the only thing that matters. We need to forgive and move on. And it was really powerful seeing that take place. Um, you know, the Mayor family still refusing. I, I just, this is an incredibly wealthy family. And they, <laughs> I, I, it seems they're somewhat cursed um, the, the Timothy Mayer's three great grandsons, uh, two of them have just died at the time of their deaths the other brother was suing one of them for having stolen a million dollars of their inheritance from him <laughs> and that kind of sums up the Mayer experience as far as, as I'm concerned uh, they do have a number of Clotilda artifacts apparently um, they have bragged for years to having the steering wheel out of the ship and things like that and so it's, you know, it's time for them to, to turn all those things over so they can be on display in a museum, um, things like that. The worst part about the, the, what's happened with the Mayer family is, um, you know, Africatown was purchased by the Africans from pieces of the Mayer's plantation. So the Mayer's still own all the land around Africatown, and they are busily rezoning it from residential to industrial to add more industry. Africatown is trying to fight off all this industry. What's really, really bad about that is the mayors up until the 1960s were one of the largest landlords in Africa town starting in the 1880s they built 500 houses in Africa town and in 1968 in protest of the city of mobile finally bringing water and sewer service to Africa town the mayors announced they were tearing down all their houses so they kicked all the families out 500 families and they bulldozed all the houses and at the time the the patriarch of the mayor clan who was Timothy mayor's grandson was quoted saying about his African-American tenants, he don't need water. They've been living perfectly fine without it for years. He doesn't need a bathtub. He wouldn't know how to use it. He'd probably store food in it. And that was quoted in the local newspaper. Um, you know, he felt brave enough in 1968 saying, saying that out loud. 
And so that's, you know, that's the mayor's legacy in Mobile and in Africatown. Now that the Clotilda has been found, what do you think Africatown's fate will be? Well, I hope Africatown's fate is, is back to its original trajectory, which was one of ascendance. The ship is in very good shape. Um, I have touched it. I have held the wood in my hands, and it can be dug up. The state of Alabama right now keeps talking about not digging the ship up. They keep talking about leaving it in place in the mud and building a concrete pier over it like uh, at Pearl Harbor. So that instead of uh, so people to, to get near it would have to take a boat through this alligator infested swamp where I found it and then stand on this concrete pier. Instead, that ship should be dug up and put on display in a world class museum in Africa. So there were 20,000 ships in the slave trade. Less than uh, 13 have been found counting Clotilda. Most of them were, were ships that sank in ports. None of them were involved in the American slave trade. In the Smithsonian's African American History Museum in Washington, fantastic museum, they have a piece of a slave ship on display, but it's a South African ship that sank in port in Brazil, never involved in the American trade, and the piece they have is about the size of a brick. Well, here we have an entire ship. The contents of the hold are still in it, the casks of everything and all that that was on it. We need to dig the ship up and put it on display in a museum in Africa Town, a real world-class museum. The new lynching museum, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, has generated a billion-dollar impact on the local economy. Imagine having the last slave ship on display when we have everything I spoke about with the legacy of the people. We know everything about all the families that came from it, the people who were on the ship. So imagine that museum. Meanwhile, as we're unable to get the state of Alabama to commit to digging it up, the Smithsonian and the French government are building two museums in Benin, $25 million apiece, to uh, talk about that country's slavery era history. Now, how on earth can Benin, one of the poorest countries in the world, have two $25 million museums, an Africa town, home to these people stolen from Benin with the last slave ship? How can we not have a museum there? So what I hope is in five years' time, we're talking about the new museum opening and people walking in for the first time ever into this huge hall with this last slave ship sitting there. Have, um, have maritime archaeologists estimated how much it would cost to dig it up? Uh, I keep hearing 10 to 20 million. Um, you know, it's, it's not that old. The ship is from 1860. We've dug up several ironclads in Mississippi that are on display there. Uh, we dug up the Hunley, a Civil War era um, submarine. It's on display. Look at the Vasa in Stockholm. This, that's a ship that's, you know, over a thousand years old, and it's now dug up and on display. Anybody who says we can't do this is, is, is just lying, and it's just a matter of money, and it's not that much money. If the state of Alabama is too broke to do it, which they are, um, then let's have an act of Congress. You know, this is a global, internationally historic artifact, and it should see the light of day. We have about five minutes, and uh, you probably won't like this, but I want to spend them talking a little bit about you. Um, you, okay. tell, <laughs> you tell readers in your book that you got so involved in this project that you lost your job of two decades at the Mobile newspaper. Newspapering is in your family. We found a clip in our archives of your father, Hal Raines, former New York Times editor, talking about you and your brother and him a uh, long time back. Here's, this is from 1994. Very brief. Let's listen. Those are my sons, Ben on the left as I'm looking at it, and uh, Jeffrey on the right when they were about 10 and 12 with their first fly rods on the Rapidan. Uh, just to the left of the, that on the screen, you can see Ben at age three, uh, or actually he was age five then, and Jeffrey, who's out of the picture in that shot, was three. They're both ardent fishermen. They're just back from a nine-day trip down in the Louisiana bayous, so they told me today. When was the last time you went fishing together? Uh, we fished together in the fall, and I'm going down uh, a, in uh, a few weeks to uh, spend a week with them. Uh, we like to fly fish in salt water. We do a lot of that these days. So for the rains, a life in journalism and a life on the water. So what's next for you? Um, well, you know, I, I want to do everything I can to help Africatown right now. Um, I covered that community for many years and know that there are all sorts of um, things that need fixing. So any way I can lend my voice uh, to help there. I, I'm eager to. Um, I have two uh, documentaries in the works that are going to come out, um, and these are kind of my other secret love. One is about uh, carnivorous plants, pitcher plant logs and things. Uh, 
and the other is a is a um, an aquatic documentary. It's going to be another underwater film, um, like the the underwater forest, another one I made. Uh, and I hope to write some more books. Um, but you know, as a journalist, and as you mentioned, I no longer have my daily newspaper job. Um, as a journalist, the thing you want more than anything is to write something that that changes people's lives, that helps. And I just don't think I could ever come up with anything I could ever do again that would that with the the power and potential that this story has had. Um, so I, I just want to uh, get back out there and see what else we can find and what we can do. Um, and and uh, so I guess I guess the answer is who knows. <laughs> Well, on that note, uh, you describe this, and I think you just alluded to this, as one of the most profound experiences of your life. Uh, you took that phone call from your friend Jeff, and all of this ensued. So uh, I'm wondering what, what it is about this particular thing, all those years as an investigative journalist, that really resonated with you, and why you got so involved in this story. Well, uh, originally, I just jumped into it as a mystery that needed solving. Um, because people here in the local area were starting to say, oh, the Clotilla, that didn't really happen. They just say that over in Africa town. So I got into it just as a as the thrill of the hunt. Let's solve a mystery. Um, something we haven't discussed is that before I found the Clotilda, I first found another ship, and I thought it was the Clotilda. And I wrote an article, and it went viral internationally saying this might be the Clotilda, it wasn't. I was humiliated on an international journalism stage as a reporter. For me, you know, I, I try never to have a correction. And here, I really blew it <laughs> in front of the whole world. Um, and so uh, that experience, when there was a meeting in the community where the archaeologists came to town and announced the first ship I found couldn't be the Clotilda, the emotions I saw there in that room, there were about 200 people. People started crying. Um, some people started accusing the state. Of, of lying, that it was the Clotilda and they were trying to hide it. Uh, and I, 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 I felt the power of the story and what it meant to Africa town and, and by association, the African American diaspora, that this ship was proof of everything that had happened. And so that really, when I went back to look for it after this first failure, I went with a renewed sense of purpose and I understood that I was a part of something really powerful that, um, I just had to, it had to happen. I had to do it. I had to figure it out. Um, and I, I will say I almost gave up after that big disappointment. Um, you know, it was a humiliation, um, the biggest of my life. And I was at the meeting in Africa town right after they announced it. And one of the descendants came up to me, Thelma Mabin Owens and wrapped me in a hug. And she sang this gospel song in my ear. There's a bright side somewhere. Don't look, don't stop until you find it. And she let go of me and held me by the shoulders and said, keep looking until you find it, Ben. And um, it just felt like sort of a mission from God, if I could say that. Ben Rains, thank you for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Your new book is called The Last Slave Ship, the true story of how Clotilda was found, her descendants, and an extraordinary reckoning. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. I loved it. That was great. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 